Well, good evening, residents of the East Contra Costa Fire Protection District. Fire Chief Brian Helmick here to do another week's of our Facebook live event, which is going to be shared on YouTube, Facebook, and also on Periscope. Um, as always, I'm going to pause for a moment to make sure that we are streaming live another week's as we are, as I can see on my own phone here. Um, I'm asking everyone that is watching this event, uh, please share it. Uh, please share it to um, anybody that you believe this information will be valuable for, um, as I do believe we have a lot of good information uh, to share to you uh, today. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Again, I'm going to go through a little bit of housekeeping to make sure that we have as many people um, on this, because I do believe the information is valuable. This uh, update is going to be a little unique as we've had a very busy week of activity operationally. And uh, I want to be able to provide not only an update of what's been going on, which was about what was the recently the Deer Zone incident, uh, which is transitioning to the SCU uh, Lightning Complex. That SCU stands for um, the Santa Clara Unit uh, for CAL FIRE Lightning Complex. So. I want to provide an update on the complex incident. Um, I also want to be able to um, give you some loose ends and housekeeping. And so the information that's on that screen, we're going to keep that there. Um, anyone that wants information on that incident, I'm going to be referencing that in here in a minute. So please write that down. But let me talk to you about who this is for. Again, this is for the residents and businesses of the East Contra Costa Fire Protection District. Again, I'm your fire chief, Brian Helmick. If you live in Brentwood, Oakley, Knightson, Bethel Island, Discovery Bay, fire in Marsh Creek, Morgan Territory. Uh, this is a medium for us to be able to get information out to you. Uh, this is the fourth time we've done this. Again, we're live on Facebook, YouTube, and Periscope. And the overall objective is to inform and to continue to educate our community on not only the district's activities, um, the challenges we have within the district, very specific topics. Tonight, we're gonna be talking to you about the criteria that it's gonna take to fix our problem. And I think even mo more importantly th than that is that we provide a question and answer session uh, for you to ask any questions that you may have. I also wanna be clear that the information or questions you ask don't have to be related to the video that we have, although we're gonna be focusing on a very uh, specific topic tonight. But if you have any questions about the fire district unrelated to the topic, they'll be in the video um, about the ongoing operations that I don't cover. Um, it would be very important uh, for you to ask. We have one hour tonight to be able to not only go through the video, the organizational update, and a, and a question and answer session, and also know that this is being recorded. Uh, this is not only live, but it's recorded. If you go on the district's website, on the very first link, it says it's fire season, and there's a splash page that we have there. We'll call it the splash page you can go into. All the videos we do are archived, and they're there for your review. Uh, we ask that you share this information for anyone that finds it valuable. Uh, if there's any updates I'm giving, you, you can share them on your individual pages, as I'm going to give a lot of information outside of the video topic we have here tonight, uh, specifically to the, so the, the Santa Clara unit, the SEU Lightning Complex, which was previously the Deer Zone um, incident, and uh, hopefully we can provide some good information to all of you. Uh, there's going to be additional future opportunities. Um, we are doing a... Uh, I'll hit this at the end and we're going to be doing a town hall meeting at Discovery Bay on Monday, a virtual town hall like this is a different format. The previous town halls that we've done in other communities in Brentwood, Oakley and Bethel Island, those are also archived on our website. We will be working to go also to the Marsh Creek Morgan Territory area on Thursday, September 10th. I'm really looking forward to that opportunity as uh, we have some housekeeping to do, uh, which I'll be sharing a little bit of that here tonight. And uh, I look forward to engaging with those members of the community. And then we'll be in Byron Knights and um, working them together on September the 14th. Uh, so I appreciate all of you being on here tonight. If you have any questions for us, because we are live streaming on Facebook, Periscope, and YouTube, please populate in your questions now. When you start populating your questions, it takes some time for it to get uh, transferred to us. We will answer as many of those as we can. If for some reason we don't answer any of your questions tonight, for one of two reasons. We just run out of time and or I don't have the answer for you. Uh, I'd rather give you accurate information than just any information. Um, continue to ask those questions or I'll take them offline with you and I'll work to address them as we move forward. 
Uh, so again, thank you uh, for joining. So a little bit of housekeeping here tonight. Uh, so all of you that are watching, you know, I'm gonna reach out specifically to the residents of uh, Marsh Creek and Morgan Territory. Um, I wanna thank you uh, for working with us. Um, and I also wanna thank uh, very, very much uh, Cal Fire. I wanna thank Cal Fire, um, the, the, uh, the SEU Lightning Complex, which was originally the Deer Zone incident. Um, I'm happy to report a couple of things. Number one, um, CAL FIRE, we are in the process of transitioning the fire fully uh, to CAL FIRE. Um, they are doing a fantastic job. Uh, the, it, the incident is in the SRA, the state regulated area. It's in East Contra Costa Fire District. And the relationship we have with CAL FIRE, for those of you that don't know, is when we respond to incidents, it is our responsibility because we're the local response agency is that we hit it hard and we hit it fast with the resources that we have. And the objective is to hold it until the state resources arrive at scene. We do have the Sunshine Station um, out there on Marsh Creek Road. Uh, we do with the Amador agreement we have with them to where uh, they staff that station during the summer months. And we contract with them to keep it open during the winter months. And so we have a great working relationship with them. Uh, they're great cooperators, uh, cooperators with us. I also wanna thank Contra Costa County Fire and other agencies. We've had uh, agencies throughout the county and now all the way throughout the state, we had up to uh, 300 plus firefighters working the incident. Uh, we had aircraft, dozers, and many apparatus uh, throughout the state uh, working that incident and they continue to. Uh, so very specifically to the incident, I wanna give some details and I wanna talk about some things real quick. The incident right now, um, and this is the information provided to us by CAL FIRE. They're going to be the information sources we move forward. The information on the bottom of my screen is what I recommend all residents to continue to look at to get additional information on the fire. Uh, Fire.ca.gov backslash incident. Again, it is the SCU um, Lightning Complex. Um, that is the name of the fire now, and that is where you can get information on it. The fire is 1,200 plus acres, 0% containment at this time. And that was as of last night. Uh, they anticipate they'll be doing a flyover tomorrow morning uh, to update that containment numbers, but that is the information I have at this time. Uh, we've only had one firefighter injury, heat related, happy to say that he uh, is fine um, at this point, uh, but we have no citizen injuries. We have no structures lost and or damage at this time. There are still mandatory evacuations in place uh, for the Marsh Creek Road, all of Marsh Creek Road, um, and I'm sorry, Marsh Creek Road from Round Valley uh, to Morgan Territory and Morgan to all of Morgan Territory is still evacuated. Uh, the information to get more information on the incident is down below. Uh, we East Contra Costa Fire because Cal Fires had the reflex time to get the resources they need, need uh, throughout the state to not only continue to contain that incident, work that incident, uh, they released the local resources back to our jurisdiction. We're back at normal staffing as of today. Um, and so it took us a couple of days. Um, we recalled up to 24, 25 of our members um, out of the 33 that we have. So all chief officers came back. Many of our firefighters came back, not only to work the incident uh, on the Hill, but also to maintain the district staffing. And we had to let firefighters also recover due to fatigue. So we had major rotations going on, uh, but we were able to hold the line. So we're in a transitional phase right now. Um, Cal Fire is running the incident. We are supporting them in a manner of we are a um, cooperator with them. Uh, our chief officers will be attending meetings on a daily basis to make sure that we continue to work towards resolving this incident directly. And so what I wanna do before I move on is I wanna say a couple of things, again, very specifically to the residents of Marsh Creek and Morgan Territory, is that um, I want you to know that your fire district takes great pride in what we do. All these incidents are really complex and they're very challenging and they're very hard to be able to not only respond, but communicate effectively and information flow is always a challenge and we strive to get better. Um, I do know that uh, we have room for improvement. We have heard, I want you to let you know I've heard you in regards to the comments, the questions, the concerns about how the district uh, communicated evacuation and cooperation with our partners. And I take responsibility for how that is done um, and how it was done. And we do have room for improvement. Uh, secondarily, as I do know that this impacts you in regards to being evacuated and we are doing in the best interest of not only your lives and your property, 
Um, and we are working diligently to lift any evacuations, but they're there for a reason. And we have to, so we have to support the incident commander's recommendations, and we do. And so information flow is something we want to work on. We want to make sure that you have accurate, relevant, and updated information. It's very hard to do. Um, I thank you for your patience. I thank you for working with us. And we are going to be meeting with you on a later date. Not so much to talk about the district situation, its funding situation, but more to talk about how we can continue to work with you. Um, and we are going to highlight our situation, but I just want you to know that I hear you. Um, we have been doing a lot of internal uh, briefings already, debriefings. Uh, we have some opportunities, not only internally, but externally, of how we can operate better. And um, so as we continue to move forward throughout this incident and future ones, I want to let you know as I hear you, um, and we're doing the best that we can. So as we move forward, we're going to continue to try to share the information we get from CAL FIRE to try to keep everybody into the know, but they are going to be the information source and the information is on the bottom of your page. So if there's anything I may have missed, um, please forward the questions in. Um, but again, for all of you within our jurisdiction that have been impacted by this incident, I, I thank you for the flexibility um, and the support. Um, I also uh, commend our firefighters coming in through emergency recall and otherwise, as we stated, we almost had three shifts worth of, we almost had a whole department back here uh, running everything and, and mandatory recalls are a request to our members that come in and they stood up. And not only were we able to manage the incident on the Hill, we were always answer the calls here, but we were at one point had to downstaff our stations because we had to let one station sleep and we rotated people through in four hour shifts to be able to get sleep. There were many members that have been up for five, six days at the time um, and the four hour sleep they got is the first sleep they got in 24, 48 hours. So it was hard. Uh, so the lack of resources we have, we felt it. Uh, we felt it impacted us. So I hope that gives us a good update on uh, that incident. If I missed anything at the until end, we can do more questions. Um, but again, uh, thank you for being here. So for tonight, we're going to focus on a video. Uh, where we are going to get into the Q and A. Um, tonight, what we're doing is we're focusing on the criteria uh, to fix the district's historic revenue problems. I'm hoping that not only the video, uh, but also my explanation at the end provides a little bit of understanding of how we arrived at our guiding principles and some of the things that you may see. Uh, so please share this event again. We're gonna watch this short video. Please start to forward your questions in. It'd be very great to make sure that we can start addressing them. And uh, once we watch the video, I'll add upon it um, and then we'll go right into the Q&A. So again, thank you for joining us tonight. Hope you enjoyed the video. I've absolutely seen in my travels an awareness and an understanding of the district's current challenges. We have had a lot of interaction. We had a lot of really good feedback, constructive and otherwise. Chronologically, how we arrived here, what our challenges are, um, the, the citizens are becoming more aware, those that are exposed to the message, and they seem to agree and understand how we arrived at where we're at. Since 2017, when I came in as the fire chief, there have been a lot of concepts from either individuals, groups, organizations, or otherwise at the local and state level um, that have been brought to the fire district in concept to be able to address and or improve our service levels. The three areas that we need to make sure on any initiative that we can build upon to be able to improve and increase service levels in the district the money's gotta be guaranteed to the fire district, it's gotta be a sustainable, and it has to be the right amount. One thing we need to ensure is that the money is guaranteed to the fire district. We have learned that government pass-throughs or getting revenue short-term from another organization through policy or resolution, there is easily changed and reverted back through policy or resolution. And for that reason, it's gotta be guaranteed to the fire district, come to the fire district to meet the missions and our needs. Secondarily, it's gotta be sustainable. If the revenues that we bring in the district are not sustainable, any service level increases we build on non-sustainable solutions, those that we employ to work in those positions see their position as temporary. It is a non-sustainable position. It is a bridge to nowhere. So we need to make sure that it is sustainable so we can continue those service levels going into the future and we can retain the personnel we hire to work in those positions. And lastly, the third thing is we need to make sure it's the right amount. If the amount, if it's not guaranteed, and if it's not sustainable, and if it's not the right amount, to be able to invest into our, our strategic initiatives within the organization sustainably long-term, we cannot increase service levels to a certain degree unless we get the revenues at the right amount to be able to do so.
Okay. So the criteria required to fix our problem, this is, uh, this is a really important topic, and I do appreciate all of you understanding this at the end of what I have to say, or hopefully a little bit clear. We have guiding principles in the district, and I think the, the hard thing I have a hard time communicating about the guiding principles within the district is we did not get these principles just offhand. Through decades, two decades as a fire district from 2002 to current, and really from 2012 to date, we have experienced, as I stated, trying to exercise concepts or ideas that created unattended consequences in other areas of the fire district that we're now managing to undo because we chased concepts, we chased ideas. And we realized when we didn't apply by the criteria of it being uh, guaranteed sustainable and or the right amount, it created so many other system issues that I want to talk a little bit about today and expand upon a little bit today. Furthermore, one of the things we didn't talk about in the video, even about criteria, and one that we've been uh, really getting exposed to recently is there's a lot of concepts that could potentially impact law enforcement, EMS, or other agencies we rely upon operationally. And we have found that to be equally detrimental because although we can get more resources to be on the street to serve you, we rely upon law enforcement. We rely upon the ambulances. We work as a team. And so if we get revenue that isn't guaranteed, it is not sustainable, it is not the right amount, and if it attacks and or takes away and decreases the capabilities of our partner agencies, we're just really transferring the problem. And so to expand, you know, the guarantee, the money being guaranteed, we historically, those who have been watching the fire district, we have been on a, on a roller coaster. We are on a roller coaster from 2012 to 2017 to provide adequate services. Anyone that lived here in that period of time felt it, saw it, and heard it. We would open a station, close a station, open a station, and close a station. And some of the, one of the reasons is that the monies that are given to us were not guaranteed. When monies are given to us on a one offer through another board or another council or another area, and we don't build mechanisms in place to build very long terms of understandings and our agreements and make them guaranteed, and there is not laws or statutes or revenue measures or anything along those lines, if things aren't guaranteed to the fire district and they can be undo done through a change of governance of an organization or through a let resolution or a policy, we have experienced and we have had a situation to where we have we have a um, a situation where the monies are given to the district change. And so although a resolution put into place on a resolution undid it. And so we and we can't turn our services on and on by a faucet. And so the situation we find is that we put re, we have revenue coming in. We're trying to provide a sustainable resource and the money isn't guaranteed to us because it isn't locked. And that's one of the reasons why the district leans towards assessments. Assessments really aren't undone. Um, they don't go undone unless there's sunset clauses built into them and or another initiatives put in place to re, re, uh, take them away or the governing board as the fire board stops acting upon. It. Um, it is a guaranteed source of revenue to the fire district, as is the allocation and the ad valorem amount, although it's low within the district, that's guaranteed to the fire district. And our fire protection law and statute states that assessments and taxes are the main way we get revenue. Uh, but we are looking for creative other ways to get revenue right now, but we have to be guarded when it's not guaranteed. And so when and if revenue comes in the district, we try to, we need to make it as ironclad as possible to make sure that revenue doesn't go away. Sustainability is another challenge that we had, as I stated in the video, if we, we have lived on short-term monies, one, one year, two year, three year, um, but the money is uh, not is not uh, sustainable. When we bring employees into the fire district, they look and say, listen, I don't have, there's not sustainable funding for my position. There's not sustainable services for what it is that we're doing. And it's a short term service level. And we lost many, many, as I say in the video, many employees that came in and the district fought and tried to get short term revenues. With non and they had non-sustainable solutions at the time, and people left. Understand, short-term monies, non-sustainable monies can work if they're bridges to sustainable revenue. If there was revenue that came in 
and we knew it was coming in in a year or so, we could use a short-term solution to build a bridge and cre increase resources, but it's gotta be sustainable. Uh, furthermore, not the right amount. You know, if the district doesn't have, if we get this guaranteed money and it is sustainable to open one fire station, we can't open three. I know that seems elementary, simple and basic, but we get challenged at it all the time is we wanna give you some money. That is guaranteed, it is sustainable, but we have a three station deficit. Well, it's gotta be the right amount. So as we look at this, you'll hear the fire district always speak to this when any concept or initiative comes up. Is the money guaranteed? Is it sustainable? Is it the right amount? And most recently, does this concept negatively impact those we rely upon on the streets? And if the answer is no to any of those, the question is how do we correct that? How do we, how do we resolve it? And that has been very problematic and it has been very, very challenging. So um, that kind of gives an idea um, of the criteria required. We talk about it all the time at our board meetings. We talk about it at other agencies' meetings. And I think the thing to walk away with again is that we um, didn't just arrive here. Your fire district is undoing the negative consequences, un unintended negative consequences for taking ideas or utilizing what people called solutions that were not guaranteed. They were not sustainable. They didn't provide the right amount. And it caused a whole slew of other issues that we have. So today, we as a fire district are sustainable at a three station model. We're sustainable administratively for 10 years. Operationally, we are not. We have a three station deficit. We have nine firefighters on a day. We should have no less than 18. We know through growth, we'll need another nine stations. And for a total, of, I'm sorry, another three stations for a total of nine. And we have mechanisms in place. We're in the implementation phase to address our growth, to be able to not only build stations, but sustainably staff those stations. But the growth solution legally cannot address the existing service level uh, challenges. So as we continue to explore, understand that the board is gonna continue to look for guaranteed, sustainable, guaranteed amounts that don't impact our other service provider solutions. And we're kicking over every rock, you know, trying to do that. So that's the criteria. Let's go. I'm going to start um, getting into the questions and hopefully we'll address them. It looks like we have a good 40 minutes to continue to work through questions. And uh, I'll do some housekeeping at the end. Uh, please share, ask your questions, and let's take the uh, first question. No aerial support available. Okay, so I'm going to assume the no, I'm going to hit this in two ways. Um, the no aerial support I'm going to take from the what was the deer zone incident? And then um, I can also deal with aerial apparatus, which they'll take those in two ways. I'm gonna assume it's for the, the um, Morgan Territory incident. So that is right. Um, listen, the, the state, uh, if you go on to what I gave you, the fire.ca.gov incidents, and you look at what the state is doing uh, in regards to the fires, it is, uh, is tremendous of uh, the fires going on up and down the state. We are going from the deer zone incident. The deer, the zone defines the geographical area that we're in within the Santa Clara unit. The, the deer zone has been brought into the Santa Clara unit lightning complex because that lightning incident that came through, what was it, Sunday morning? Yeah, Saturday night, Sunday morning. Um, it started a ton of fires. And there are multiple zones or multiple fires. At one point, I believe we had up to 16 fires. And they are triaging, which means they're sorting out. And they're looking at where is the high probability of life loss, the highest probability of, of structure loss. And they're making calculated and very difficult decisions for the whole unit. And originally, we were on the top of that list. When I say we, the deer zone was on the top of the list. And initially, if you were monitoring in the first 12 hours, we had a lot of air support. Then we got about eight dozers on the incident, 300 firefighters on the incident, and other incidents were in the queue. They were escalating and they were growing and they had to transfer it to the ground resources and move it to other units. It's a very collaborative effort. It isn't, we don't have resources just sitting on the ground unassigned. It is that they're calculated again. We are, we are actively still fighting that fire. 
and there are no structures, no life loss, thank God. And we're doing a good job guarding and protecting, but that is correct. Right now, there are not available air resources. They do fly over to recon. They do fly over to measure. They do fly over and the need were to change and the need were to rise. They would adjust accordingly. But we have very dynamic and complex, complex incidents going all the way through the Santa Clara unit. And so that is why you don't see it here today, but it was here earlier on. We did anticipate on day two, the second operational period, and any of those that saw, they asked, I got, I got asked by some members, we did plan. Uh, we very much did plan on day two um, for there to be a heavy presence of aerial, um, uh, have a lot of air work being done. Um, priorities, respectfully, with life loss and property, had to change and get redirected due to fire behavior and otherwise. And so it, these things are very dynamic. They're not static. And so that's why there's no overhead aerial support for the deer zone incident and now the SCU lightning complex within the deer zone. The district does not have an aerial firefighting apparatus if that's what, what is regard to we rely on um, mutual aid. That is a special request from other agencies throughout the county. The fourth station that comes into the mix that can hold, I mean, can staff um, an aerial apparatus. We, we are short three stations. Again, we have three, we're short three. Uh, the first one we're intending to have a truck, which we uh, which we don't have, and that puts us at a, at a huge operational disadvantage to be able to fight fires above two stories. And we have many of them within our jurisdiction, and so we currently do not have what we call trucks. Uh, we have fire engines, but trucks get us above three stories when we need those uh, for any commercial occupancy, industrial occupancy, residential over two stories. Uh, we have to call mutual aid, and if they're not available, they can't come. If they do. They do. Uh, so that, that addresses aerial apparatus. Can people of the Clayton Palms community of Marsh Creek return to their homes or is the evacuation in effect and everyone should stay out of the complex? Yes, it is still in effect and everyone should stay out of the complex. Please continue to look at the fire.ca.gov incidents um, and also that uh, phone number I gave you. Uh, can we put that back up again, please? The phone number. The 699-247-7431, that is, that is specific to the SCU Lightning Complex. It is a recorded line with active information specific to the fires within the SCU Lightning Complex. If you call that, they will, they will provide updates on mandatory evacuations, lifting evacuations, and permanent information. It is run by CAL FIRE. Uh, we continue to work with them on information flow and challenges as we're trying to do here tonight. Uh, but this is the deal. The mandatories are still in effect. And this is another thing too, is I understand, I, I sincerely do, I understand mandatory evacuations, uh, how it can disrupt and it can change things. Uh, and it makes it very difficult for people because you're, you're mandatory evacuating from your home. We have this at times, there are people that do not listen to the mandatory evacuations for many of reasons. And what I try to communicate is, listen, we are doing everything we can to keep the fire out of the areas of which are evacuated. We have them there because the fire behavior we're dealing with is very erratic and it burns very quickly. When and if we're doing everything we can to keep it out of the evacuated areas, but the evacuated areas are in potential threat. When and if the weather advances, it gets across our containment lines, whatever may occur, or we're doing everything we can to keep them out of our containment lines. When we go and we respond into those incidents, and the situation is now, our first priority is always going to be, it's always going to be life safety first, property second, environment third. With that being said, when we go in and you find that people are still there and they're evacuating. We focus on a life, we focus on the evacuation, and we don't have the time to focus on the property. It's an added layer of complexity as the people are our priority. And so if it's done in advance, if it is done and we get there and we're unrestricted, it, it helps us do what we need to do. So furthermore, it, it really congests the roads and it causes additional um, challenges. Um, I also wanna highlight as I'm getting a, a text here and I think my Fire Marshal PIO, um, our public information officer, that um, that the fire is has consumed three thousand acres. 
Um, and um, so what I said previously, this is uh, new news to me, um, but they are, um, it's, it's at, it just in 3000 acres consumed, uh, but still I'm being told is 0% contained. So um, on the evacuations, I, yes, they're still in place. So thank you for abiding by the order. Next question, please. Great question, and we're getting a lot of this. So what donations of the firehouse request, if any? And actually, here's the thing. Um, we, as the fire district, love the community support. I cannot, our members are getting run hard. They're doing a lot of things. We feel you, and we see you, and we hear you, and we cannot thank you uh, for the, the amount of people that have been reaching out to us and providing donations. Um, what I will tell you is is right now what I need, if anyone's watching and listening about donations, is that um, we are, our supplies and and operationally, uh, we're tired. Our members are tired, we're run, but we, we have the supplies that we need. And our firefighters need to get some rest. Uh, they need to continue to run their calls, but we currently do not have any needs from supplies. With that being said, there's a lot of people impacted. The incident continues to grow. Um, we, we work hand in hand with the American Red Cross. Uh, so it is asked donations to go to the American Red Cross to continue to support the ongoing operations. They support our, our incidents, they support our evacuation centers, and they're a great part. Uh, secondarily, if there are people that really want to uh, support our, um, our firefighters, um, that is not done through the fire district, there's an independent association called the East Contra Costa Firefighters. Um, association and the East County Firefighters Association, uh, they do take donations. The fire district does not. We are we are here to serve you, but our uh, the association through the firefighters, they, they are very community oriented. Uh, they are very community focused. They do things not only for the community, but they also do things. Uh, we have a historic piece of equipment that is restored. Um, they come alongside the families of our volunteer firefighters and our active firefighters that uh, get injured, get hurt, or lose their life actively and or once retired. Um, and so they are an extension and uh, all of our members, myself, we all participate in that and that is uh, the, an association. Uh, the gentleman that is in charge of overseeing that operation is Robert Ruddick. Uh, so attention Robert Ruddick, but the email address, if anyone wanted to uh, go to the association is east, so E-A-S-T-C-C-F-A at gmail.com. East ccfa at gmail.com. So I'm asking for, we love the community support, uh, but not only due to COVID, but also to the active in, in incidents that we're in. We're asking for people not uh, to come to the stations. We feel you um, to give donations as we're trying to be operational ready for what we do. Um, and, we're, and we're trying to, when the members have downtime, to give them downtime uh, for them to be able to get some rest. So uh, again, the East CCFA at gmail.com is the Firefighters Association and then the American Red Cross. Uh, and we appreciate you uh, supporting us in that manner. We, we hear and see you community and we love you for it. Thank you. Next. Is there an ETA when the evacuations from Marsh Creek will be lifted? Great question. And that's fair. Um, as I stated previously, I do not have um, a timeline on that. What is asked is that is going to be continued to be driven by the operations, the incident commander, we call it IC, um, and the evacuation coordinators uh, for the SCU Lightning Complex. That phone number for information, the website is going to be the information. I want to let you know, myself, Chief Albert, and, uh, and Operations Chief Ross McCumber. We are meeting multiple times per day with the incident command team, although we are operationally off the incident. As of today, we got all of our units off and CAL FIRE is running the incident. We are still administratively engaged. We know we wanna work on better information flow. We, we hear and we are, we are trying. And we are trying to see what we can do to responsibly lift any evacuations. They're monitoring and looking at the situation as information flows will become available. We'll push it out in cooperation and through the direction of CAL FIRE when available. But right now, um, we do not have an ETA, uh, but we're continuing to push and making sure as soon as it one becomes available, we get that information to you. So I do thank you for your patience. Next question, please. 
what tax is being used to fight the fires on the deer zone fire and how often um, is the fire being measured? Uh, so we, I'm not, I don't want to get in strategy and tactics to respect everyone's time here, but we use direct fire attack and indirect fire attack. Sometimes uh, we will not only use water, but sometimes we use fire and we use retardant uh, to be able to address the fire. All of those methods are being used uh, directly on this incident. Um, and so listen, the, the men and the women of CAL FIRE that are now on this incident and previously the members of our organization with many throughout the county, uh, we use not only indirect, but also direct. We use water, we use air attack, we're using dozers. Um, we're doing everything that we can and every method possible being only contain, but also extinguish. Uh, if I, I put that question back up, please. I don't want to miss any components. Um, and how often is it being measured? Uh, so when we have, this is another thing that, that uh, goes back to that previous question about air support. It is very difficult for us to get accurate measurements without air support. Uh, and so the measurements are being done on as frequently and as often as they can. Uh, the fact that I just got that update that has consumed 3,000 acres, and I think an update on containment, uh, is because they probably reconned and flew the fire. Um, so it is that is one of the challenging things, again, is because we're trying to coordinate and cooperate with multiple agencies. I know there were, there were instances in this incident early on where information flow, uh, there were discrepancies on acreage, evacuation points. I saw it. Uh, we worked to correct it as rapidly when we did. And we have already connected and communicated among not only county, uh, county OES, the fire district, CAL FIRE. Uh, we've identified and we're trying to be uniform as we move forward. And we, we strive for that not to happen, but sometimes things are different. Uh, so how often? Um, there's not like we do it on a, a set time. We do it as frequently as we can and try to provide the updates. But as I stated, air support is limited and it is hard to gauge without that air support because the footprint is so big. And the train, anyone that's been out there, from Round Valley all the way working towards um, up towards uh, Marsh Creek. Um, it's some rough country up there and uh, there's a lot of train to cover and it's hard without air support to get accurate measurements. Uh, so we do it as frequently as we can and I've been, they obviously did it recently and it looks like they're doing it again tomorrow morning. Next question, please. The other day in the deer update, you mentioned browning out a station to assist fatigue. What station was browned out? And is there any idea how long that is expected? I appreciate you taking the time to update on uh, the fourth right with the district and department's issues. So, yeah, so what we did um, is as the incident was escalating, uh, we had all of our engine companies assigned through what is called initial attack. Uh, the fire came in, we responded all three of our engines and we rolled tandem, which means they took not only our wildland units, our type three engines, and they rolled tandem with water tenders. They brought their own water with them. So three people on each engine, but they brought two pieces of equipment. One's an off-road unit, and one carries 3,000 gallons of water. And they get it to a stack of place, leave the water tender in place, fight their operations, and they have a water source. So we took all three there through initial attack. When we started getting the updates and realized it was an escalating incident, we did uh, initially right off the bat, we did a command staff emergency recall. And we got all but one of our command staff to return because one was out of the state. Um, we made contact. He said he was back in route. He'd be back the, later that evening um, and or the morning in worst case. Um, and by the next morning, we had all of our command staff, all four of uh, our operational battalion chiefs and our fire marshal for a total of five um, in district, including myself. So all six of us and the command staff were there. We did emergency recall through our firefighters. We got back all but I believe four of our firefighters through emergency recall. So we staffed up the engines that we had. Uh, and then halfway through the first operational period, we rotated. Uh, the members off the fire line up on the hill because they are on, were already on uh, multiple days. We had some members at that time that had been on five days straight. Uh, we had some members that had been up for already 24 hours and we knew fatigue was a factor. And that's something that we battle with constantly and we try to balance it out. So what we did is we built an operational plan to where we had, we knew we had to get guys off the hill. We knew we had to run the district. And so I want to be clear about the browning out of the station is we have three stations in our jurisdiction, one in Oakley, one in Brentwood, one in Discovery Bay. We, when I said we browned out a station, it was uh, in some ways it was a rolling brown out, but that's even kind of a misdescription. It doesn't describe it very well. What we did was we called dispatch and the two busiest engine companies we have are the Oakley and Brentwood unit. And when those units are already committed to other incidents, we will move up 
the engine from Discovery Bay because 75% of all of our calls, 80% of our calls happen within those areas. And we know the probability eight out of 10 times is going to come in those areas. So when those units in Oakley Brentwood go on call, we do an internal move up of the discovery of the engine. If, if the engines are available in those zones, we, we move them back. So what we did was we knew that members had to sleep. And so when needed, we took a unit out of service. So when 59 had to sleep, we did four hour rotations. We let 59 in Discovery Bay get four hours of sleep and um, they were out of service, in Discovery Bay. Four hours later, we would roll it to station 53 and say, all right, guys, gals, you got your four hours bunked down. We're gonna guard you, we're gonna block you. We gotta sleep, we're on a marathon here. And we need to make sure that we, we gotta give you at least four hour, four hours sleep in this operational period. And we moved up 59 to cover 53. And we, we, we let them sleep and then it was 52, two's turn. And we moved 59 over to 52. And then we did that rotation. We, we brought people around and we rotated the apparatus people were on, who got to be able to sleep and what they needed to do. So it was very dynamic. It didn't affect, and again, we are a system. So a brownout in any one area affects the whole system. We have a multi-engine response, we all go. And so it was a very dynamic, a very fluid situation. We we're moving people from over the hill down below, uh, but the goal was to be able to be able to provide the best that we can. But at the worst situation where we normally have three units in our jurisdiction, we were down to two because we had to let members sleep. But the fact that we were able to hold that line and within about 12 hours, we were able to get all three units staffed in district. We still had the units up on the hill and we had another third that were resting to rotate. And we were able today to get to a point to where we mitigated the fatigue and we're running at full service and all recall personnel as of today have been released. And so um, it's right now we're kind of licking our wounds. We're trying to get things done, but that's a good thank you to not only Cal Fire, Con Fire and all of our other supporters. Uh, but that's how we approached it. We took the jurisdiction as a whole into consideration and that's how we managed um, the fatigue challenge that we had, the resource challenge. Had. I will also say before the next question comes up, having six stations and having that bench hugely impacts that ability of not having to brown out because not only do we have more people in reserve and off duty we have more stations available within the system so not having the depth really impacts us to having to brown out or move people around we just didn't have the depth even though almost everyone came back and it was you can ask any other fire chief any other area having that many people come back from emergency recall is unbelievable it is believable. Our guys do it on a regular basis, but the fact that the level of commitment of them coming back for multiple days and when they've been on for multiple days, again, I just, it's something that I, I don't take, take for granted. Um, our members stood up strong um, this last couple of weeks and they're fatigued, but we collectively got through it. And we had some internal challenges and we already been debriefing on them and things that we can do better, um, no differently than externally. So, um, as I said to the Marsh Creek residents, we have a, we have room for improvement, but internally to the members that are watching from our agency, um, I hear you too. And and this was a very dynamic incident. We have room for improvement there too. So you're heard and seen and we're already working on it. Next question, please. Every single one of the firefighters. Yeah, and, and I wanna be clear, that's 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 anyone that was in uniform, anyone that was has a badge, regardless of the agency, the, the cooperation from again, Cal Fire, unbelievable. Uh, Contra Costa County Fire, San Ramon Valley, Moraga Renda. Um, there were units all the way strong throughout this county, adjoining agencies from the adjoining counties um, and up and down the state. I cannot um, overextend the help of um, Battalion 1616. Uh, you know who you are, um, and, and all of Cal Fire's leadership uh, for coming alongside of us and doing what we do. But um, yeah, so I have a tremendous amount of gratitude for them, and we appreciate the gratitude you have for us. Uh, but I want to understand that we are part of a bigger system. And I think that's one of the issues that we have is we think this problem is unique to us, but we constantly strain. We constantly strain the system uh, of mutual aid. And many a times we don't have the depth to go support them back because we don't have the apparatus or the resources to go return the favor. So we just don't have the depth. So, um, yeah, so again, thank you for the thank you, but that goes well beyond us. Much appreciated.
Can you please uh, provide um, an overview of area growth? Well, we have lost crews and stations. Where are the property taxes and developer fees collected? Why are they not sufficient? That is a good question. Leave that up. I don't want to miss any questions. So um, the growth in our area has been tremendous, a uh, thousand plus percent growth um, over the past couple of decades. Um, I'm, I moved to this area working as a volunteer in the late 90s. And what has happened from the 90s to date is uh, spectacular. Anyone in the community has done that. Um, so the, the area um, ha has grown uh, 10s, 20s, 50,000. You know, um, I'm not going to stretch to 100,000, but um, it's, been, it's been substantial, um, the amount of growth that we have had. The property taxes, as I've discussed in other ones, now I want to be very clear about something. Developer fees are different than taxes and assessments. Uh, developer fees are a one-time fee that developers pay, and they're very restricted on how they can be used, and they can only be used to build stations and buy apparatus that are um, to address the impacts from growth. Impact fees cannot be used for ongoing operations. They can only be used to build stations and buy apparatus to mitigate the impacts of future growth. So uh, impact fees are collected incrementally. Or that's part of our growth challenge. Okay, Our growth challenge is that impact fees and assessments, additional assessments, uh, were not added incrementally over time to increase the revenue and the restricted revenue through impact fees to build stations and buy apparatus historically. We, we are in the implementation phase right now in 2020, and it should have been done in the 90s, the 70s, the 80s. And we're doing it now. There is a lot more revenue that comes into the district that came in the 70s. Uh, but as I previously stated before, is our revenue, 96% of our revenue comes in through taxes and assessments. All of us get taxed 1% if you own a home. That 1% is divided up like a pie to go to different agencies providing services. Fire districts throughout the state, there's, there's many like us, I believe, that have the same challenges that we do to some degree. I'm searching for them. But we get 7% of that 1%. That's on average what East Contra Costa Fire gets overall, 7% of the 1%. To adequately fund this district, we need no less than 14, so we have half of the revenue that we have. So even though the revenue has increased to our district, we've gone from being a volunteer organization. So that means that people only responded to calls, they came in their vehicles, they went to the station, they got in the apparatus and they drove to a 24-7, 365 operation to run three stations sustainably. So the revenues that we have can sustainably staff three stations, 24-7, 365, but we do, we have half of the revenue that we need. And the reason we have half of the revenue that we need is because since the 70s, we were funded to be able to fund a volunteer fire organization. It was Proposition 13, it locked in the revenue and the rates for the services provided at that time. As growth continued, the fire district and the land use agencies, we should have applied for every new development after Proposition 13 went in place an impact fee on development to build future stations to mitigate each of those homes that came in. And also place a new assessment on all new properties that would incrementally bring revenue into a district to be sustainable and guaranteed to the fire district, bringing ongoing revenue to the fire district to be able to pay the firefighters to work in those stations, the impact fees built. And from the seventies until date, the impact fees have been inadequate and we do not have Throughout the whole jurisdiction, we have little pockets. We have three CFDs, about 1,500 homes of the 44,000 in our jurisdiction. If we had CFDs on all 44,000, we wouldn't be discussing. We have no deficits today. We've gone out multiple times trying to get that assessment placed on, and it's been rejected for, for reasons, which is another time, in another discussion unless it comes up. But the point being is we are now addressing growth and we're placing an impact fees, the appropriate amount of impact fees and CFDs on all future growth to not only build three fire stations, but pay for the ongoing operations for the added cost beyond the volunteer model. But today we have an existing three station deficit and that three, de three station deficit cannot be used or be funded through impact fees and CFDs to address growth. 
it has to be through some alternative guaranteed sustainable right amount solution or an assessment of which the citizens agree to place on their property and because we don't have the revenue and if the citizens get to choose to invest or not invest and that's where we are today so we're running the district the best revenue that we have it's half of what we need we've addressed what brought us here we're addressing what brought us here which is critically important the, the not having the appropriate assessments to address development is what's brought us where we are today and we're correcting it we've stopped the bleeding but how do we address our existing service level deficit is the challenge if we if we were able to apply the same methodology with the existing residents, the residents have to approve that. That's, that's at their discretion. And that's where the challenge, that's where it goes. I think everyone agrees on our problem statement, but the solution statement is a challenge. Great question. I hope that answers the uh, question. Next question, please. What is the average response time uh, to respond to calls? So what I would recommend, um, because we have different areas within the jurisdiction, we spend a lot of time on um, every month to um, address this question in detail. Uh, so what I don't want to do is I don't want to represent because uh, we do, and I'm actually going to pull it up right now on my own, and I'm going to give you some information. But if you go into the fire district's website and you go into about the district, um, it says monthly operational reports. When you click on the monthly operational reports every month, the operations chief, uh, Ross McCumber, he puts out an operational report for the district. Um, it's done on a monthly basis. We present this at our monthly board meetings. Um, we go over calls for service um, within West Brentwood, East Brentwood, uh, Discovery Byron, Oakley Knights, and Bethel Island, Marsh Creek, Morgan Territory. How many engine company rollouts? Rollouts are how many times that we go because what's important about that is because we every call that's generated, it could take three, five, seven, 15, 80, like we're dealing with here, resources to mitigate. So how many of our units rolled out? So it's gonna tell you, that's why we say we ran 7,700 calls last year, but it took 9,500 pieces of equipment to mitigate. And that's important. I mean, you don't have depth, it impacts that because not every incident takes one, uh, one engine. Many incidents take three. So it's important to understand. So it talks about rollouts. We also look at response areas um, about how many, again, um, for example, West Brentwood in the month of July had 155 calls with an average response time of eight minutes and 32 seconds. And then it relates it back to June. In June, we had 124 calls with average response time of 803. But in the calendar year of 2019, we had 1,880 calls for service with an average response time of 736. So to be very clear is we're very analytical. and We look very calculated at response times throughout our whole jurisdiction. Uh, so our if you look at average response times within uh, West Brentwood is 832. Uh, within East Brentwood is 931. Byron Discovery Bay is 1108. Oakley, 741. Knightson, 10 minutes, 55 seconds. Bethel Island, 15 minutes, 31 seconds. Marsh Creek, Morgan Territory, 11 minutes and 54 seconds. If you were to take all of those uh, in 2020 so far, our average response time um, you know, averaging those is nine minutes and 32 seconds. But understand that we have response times that go 20 plus minutes. And even more importantly, that seven, the 7,700 calls that we respond to a year, 25% of them, we don't make it to. Chew on that. 7,700 calls, 25%, we don't make it to. Units are available. But by the time they get from quarters as they get to scene, the ambulance or they self-transport or they say they're gone from scene. You don't make it at scene. Or we have to call by an outside agency because all of our resources are committed on other incidents. So response times, as accurate as they are, those are the response times for the engines that hit responding and hit on scene. We don't always make it to scene. It's under service. It's something that shouldn't happen. It, should, it happens, but it shouldn't happen daily. I mean, we're 25 percent of our calls. So um, I hope that provides you the information. If you have any questions, Chief McCumber and myself are available offline. Next question, please. It depends. How long are, are we evacuated for? I, I wish I could just 
miraculously can can mitigate that situation and be done? And the honest answer is, I don't know. Until the threat is removed, until the, you're you're no longer at risk. Um, we have very technical, trained, seasoned professional people that are eager and equally want to lift any mandatory evacuation. I can't stress it enough. It is not in our advantage to hold mandatory evacuations beyond any longer than they need to. We, we don't want to. We are actively communicating, but that is gonna be a decision made by the incident commanders. They're analyzing it on a regular basis, and I know they are eager to lift, but they will not lift until the, the threat is mitigated. And so I can't thank you and I appreciate your patience. I understand the frustrations. I, I sincerely sympathize and we're working eagerly to correct it. And I know we have many members doing the best they can right now, Cal Fire members to uh, correct that. And we're talking about it on a regular basis. So again, thank you for your patience on that. Sorry, uh, next question. That, so where, that's a great question. So I don't have time to go in depth. Now, what I would say, if you go on the district splash page about it's fire season, we're archiving all of our meetings. We did a Bethel Island town hall meeting um, Thursday, I believe it was. We spent a lot of time, I did a presentation about tax rate areas, what they call TRAs, and where are your taxes going? Please watch that video. What I'm gonna tell you is there are over 200 tax rate areas, TRAs, within our jurisdiction. And every different tax rate area gets charged that 1%. That 1% is divided differently depending upon your tax rate area. When it came into the district, the services are being provided, but that pie is divided by the services that wherever geographically you live, you, you, get, you provide services to schools, special districts, such as the fire district, water district, sewer district. Um, you may get county services, vector services, whatever it may be, schools, like I said. So when you look at your tax bill, you have a tax rate area on it. The, the presentation shows where the tax rate area is. You can go into the Contra Costa County uh, taxpayers website. You can um, you look at your tax bill and it'll tell you how it's broken down and where all your taxes are going to. The fire district receives a, a swing everywhere from 4.6% of that 1% up to 18.5% of that 1%. On average of our jurisdiction, we get 7% on average. Unfortunately, the, the areas of which have higher TRAs, tax rate areas, they're the population, we have 128,000 people, which I believe will go up when the 2020 census is done. And the areas that have higher TRAs uh, have very, very low density. And I'm gonna be very clear about this. Understand there's no one citizen more important than another. There's no one community more important than another, but we run a very dynamic system. And so because they're smaller population, they're equally important. But the point I'm trying to make on revenue is on average, we get 7%. So if you wanna know your taxes are going, please watch that video, fast forward, look at the presentation I'm doing, it'll be tax rate areas. If, it, if you want further clarity, I will sit down with you and walk you through individually or collectively. Um, through that. So um, I hope that answers your question. I know I can't get into detail exactly, but I'll tell you, if it's not going to us, your 1% taxes are going to another service provider within your jurisdiction. And as I've told you before, the rate of which we are getting was set in the 70s. And the rate is low, but it's not wrong. It funded adequately the services we provided in the 70s. The critical flaw that was in place is as growth continued, we didn't add additional revenue streams on those properties to come to the fire district to increase services slowly over time. And now we have this huge gap and that's what we're trying to correct. So we have tried, and if you go, we have, we have district legal analysis that we call white papers on the district's website. And if you were to go on the district's website and go uh, down the homepage, it says strategic planning, there are multiple white papers Legal analysis, same thing. Legal analysis, white papers, they mean the same thing. And it talks about reallocation of Proposition 13, taking money from one organization to another, you know. And it explains legally, politically, and it, it, why it is, and it has been proven to us almost uh, a non discussion starter, impossible, difficult, um, to say the least. It is not a viable solution. We, we do not have any support to undo or change at the state and or local level. 
taking revenues from one agency to another. They're saying you need to come with new revenue. We're trying creative ways of doing that. And so start there, understand where your revenue is going. It is complex. It took me a long time. It took me, it took me, came in in 17. It took me a year. It took me a year to kind of get it. And I'm still learning, right? All right. Uh, we hit our one hour mark. We're going to continue going. Where do you typically get funding? What can't? What can cities charge Melarus on new development and allocate funds to you? Great question. Um, so for us, we get funding. We get funding through property taxes. You'll go in and look at your tax rate area, and you'll see you give a certain percentage of your one percent to the fire district. We are an independent special district, which means we have a governed board electified. We serve the cities of Brentwood, Oakley, the unincorporated areas of Knights and Bethel Island, Byron, Marsh Creek, Morgan Territory. They're considered land use agencies. They don't pro provide fire and rescue services. We do. We do. We're independent of them. We're not attached to them, that we serve them, and we provide those services to them. Okay? And so we get a certain percentage of everyone's property taxes. And again, it is not adequate because it was set at a rate that was adequate at the time it was set, but is intended for agencies over time to put in the mitigation measures called assessments on new development to take care of the gap that we have. And that wasn't done. We are now doing it for future growth to address our three stations. I'll come over the next 20 years. But we have an existing service level deficit change to be able to place an assessment on your property. So that is where it comes from. We are working with the city of Brentwood to put in the impact fees that developers will pay one time to build future stations of buy apparatus. We are also in the implementation phase, hopefully in the next two months, to create is what is called a CFD, a community facilities district and all future development will be annexed. It will come into that community facilities district, which will be an assessment on all new properties to pay for the impacts of their new development. And they will bring additional revenue. So incrementally, we can open station seven, eight, and nine over the next 20 years slowly to address the impacts of development as it comes in. So we're on the implementation phase to address that. We're working with the city of Oak, uh, Oakley, Brentwood, and the county to make sure the impact fees are accurate. And we're hoping by the end of September, that will be done in uh, September, October. And we're hoping by September, October, we'll have the district-wide community facility district take care of operations. So we are working with them to put those mechanisms in place. Any other assessments that need to be done are district initiatives. It's something that the district does because it needs to be guaranteed sustainable and the right amount to come to the fire district to provide the services that we provide. We're exploring alternatives. We're looking at state propositions. We're looking at county potential taxes. We're seeing if any of those things impact the fire district positively or negatively. We're going to analyze all of that until around the November range. And the board is going to reassess and say what positive or negatively happened due to November elections, propositions, concepts, ideas. And then we are going to be looking to address the existing three station deficit. People ask me all the time, what does it take? You know, what would it cost to, uh, to address the, the situation that we have? And we are working on finalizing those studies that I'm going to be putting in front of the board. And you can watch. We're going to be putting them in front of the board and have public conversation. But we believe that uh, the range, and again, don't hold me to this, but I want people to know, is that every station would cost about $133 per year per station. That is what we believe we're going to land, and studies are going to validate it. $133 per year per station. So for three stations, it'd be $399 per year to bring additional three engines to be able to address this issue, to make it go away. Uh, if, the, if the board were to move forward with that, if they were to accept that. That's a guesstimation. The, the studies are going to inform it. But for $133 per year, because it's one station, double that for two, triple for three. Um, we know that is approximately where you know we're going to land. and We're going to continue to work on that. So... Um, listen, nobody wants new taxes. I understand that. If, if we had done our job, those assessments would be already on the tax roll before houses were even bought. It will be for all future residents. They're going to come. They're going to decide if they want to buy their home or not. We're going to say you're going to be adding stress onto our system. And for that reason, if you want to buy the home, because your home is going to impact us, your family is going to impact the system, you have to invest in the fire district. And every home over the next 20 years is going to invest into that. But how do we address with these residents? That's what we're trying to work out. And that's why it's important for you to engage. Next question, please. 
why is Davy Tree PG&E contract allowed to be working on Mountain House while having fire issues? For the past few days, I've been hearing chainsaws being used during the heat of the day. So um, that's a good question. Um, I do know that PG&E contracts uh, with multiple uh, service providers to be able to protect the infrastructure that they have and to take care of wind events to be able to provide safety in what they do. Um, and so if they're working within the fire line, they have been approved to do so um, by the incident commander and or operations group. Uh, so again, I don't wanna speak very specifically because uh, that specific situation um, I was not aware of, um, but that doesn't mean that the folks didn't. And I will tell you, I think what they're doing um, is due to the weather, due to the fire, is that we have increased fire activity is they will bring in uh, subcontractors and other crews that are licensed and trained to do that type of work. And they go in and what they do is they provide and make sure that the utilities um, are safe in sometimes fire environments. So um, I'm gonna make the assumption that was in coordination with the incident commander. Um, they have uh, ways to mitigate if any small little incidents were to occur and they work hand in hand with our resources when and if they're on the fire line. Uh, so if they're on that point, um, I don't want to make any assumptions, but I'd be more than happy to, for myself, uh, our fire marshal, our operations chief, if you would like, you can email me, uh, which I'll give you my information here in a little bit uh, to uh, get more information. And I'll look into that for you. But I believe that's the answer to the question. Next one, please. Summer Lakes off East Cyprus. We had to evacuate twice in the last eight months due to fire. Um, I, and it was, I, I respect the terrifying position. One way in, one way out. Um, but the most terrifying is that we've never been notified to evacuate. We are both registered to Nixel, yet none available. Is there anything that you can do or anything that you can rectify the situation? So um, I'm, I don't know why uh, you weren't uh, contacted through the county warning system um, and you weren't notified. What I would ask, if you reach out to us, uh, we will guide you and we will work with you uh, to identify that. I'll just give my information on now. Uh, my uh, and I'll I can forward you to the appropriate person. My phone number, my cell phone number is 925-584-8468. We'll post it on the screen here in a minute. And my email address is B-H-E-L-M-I-C-K at E-C-C-F-P-D.org. Um, I will forward you to the respective person to be able to help work with you on that. Um, I'm as concerned as you are. In regards to the evacuation points, what I want to let you know is that is a high priority for us right now. Uh, not only the Morgan Territory, Marsh Creek Corridor, uh, but also the Bethel Island area. We are working with not only the county, but the city of Oakley to mitigate and rectify that situation. We're also working on alternative, alternative means of egress within that community. Uh, but we're also going to be working on in the future, once COVID lifts, to be able to provide uh, training opportunities to exercise the plan that we're putting in place. Uh, so. Uh, we have a tentative plan that is not a formal, it is not uh, communicating for a secondary means. Uh, we're working on formalizing that, the city is, of Oakley through uh, legal agreements and understandings. Um, but we, we understand and we hear you. Um, and so uh, on that specific point, I don't want to take too much time except that it's on our radar. Contact me, I'll put you in contact with the appropriate person, but we are actively communicating um, and uh, we will, we are working in the Summer Lakes area um, it, it wasn't posted on the events, but two things, uh, Summer Lakes and Bethel Island, there were some challenges to get on the Facebook Live in Bethel Island. Um, we're going to be redoing a Q&A, not redoing the whole presentation. They can watch a previous video, but doing a Q&A to make sure we address questions of those that had accessibility issues. And also within the Summer Lakes community, um, we're working on setting up uh, a community event to be able to provide you an update. You're one of the communities that have already a community facility district on that we're very aware of. You, you, if we move forward with an assessment, if we move forward with an assessment, you're not going to be double taxed. We have mechanisms to make sure that uh, if we apply an assessment overall, that we take into consideration and we credit you uh, so you don't get double impacted. And we also understand the evacuation challenges and we want to communicate that to you. And so you, your community needs to be heard and we want to communicate with you. So Bethel Island, we hear the challenges, we're working on a play and, and Summer Lakes, we're coming soon. So um, let, either call me in the interim and we'll, we'll get in touch with you or we can, we can address a little bit more with the whole community. I appreciate the question. Thank you, thank you. Hmm. 
a new fire station in Summer Lakes. It's, it's empty. Um, new homes are being built all over. Why? Two fires in Summer Lakes, less than a year, uh, with no fix of the situation. If we could, if we have an emergency, new fire hydrants are supposed to be installed on East Cyprus. What's going on? Okay, there's a lot there. Keep up this question, please. Um, listen, the the fire district. Um, so yes, we have we have a new fire station, and that was very intentionally built um, because we know if we get revenue, we need additional stations, and so it is sitting there in preparation. And I get criticized. Why you build the station that you can't staff? Well, because I'd rather not get revenue and not have a place to staff them. We knew that we're shuttering and surplusing the station on Bethel Island. We wanted to demonstrate that we had a new station in lieu of. And so the reason we built it is preparing for growth. We're missing the revenue. Once you get the revenue, that's exactly where it's going to go. Um, the new 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 homes are being built. We we have no ability to be able to restrict growth. We, we do not, the fire district is since 2017 to date, we do not support growth without the appropriate mitigation measures on it. And, me, and people of the community, it's important for you to know this. There's a lot of properties that are called entitled, which means they've already had legally gone through the process and the approval processes and ones that have already gone through the system legally, we cannot restrict them from moving forward and place additional conditions on them. Those are unentitled at this point for the next 20 years. We are placing the appropriate impact fees and CFDs, community facility districts on them. We are, we are. And so the development that you're seeing coming in has been approved a long time ago. But I wanna let you know that your fire marshal Steve Albert, myself and the cities are working with developers to voluntarily that are already have entitled properties to be able to allow uh, for us to place CFDs and impact fees and we've been uh, somewhat successful in Oakley, and we're not successful in other areas, and and we're all, we're hitting additional growth. So we are now responsibly taking care of growth, but we cannot legally stop growth because of the issue that we have. Uh, it's called the moratorium on construction, and it's detrimental to communities. You can't you can't pull a permit to to do any home maintenance. You can't you can't pull permits. And so we are trying to be very responsible with the growth that's within the system. We're placing new mitigation measures on all new development. But that's again, why the station's there and they're being built. Um, we, we have multiple fires in the Summer Lakes area. Um, the road situation where we are, as I previously stated, and we can expand upon it more in regards to emergency egress. We have a lot of new hydrants within the Cypress corridor that we didn't before. Um, and East Cyprus, we do have a lot of new hydrants and I don't know how far out you're looking, but we have not only out East Cyprus, uh, also extending down towards, uh, Bethel Island on Delta Coves. So we, we are, our water situation is improving in that area. Um, and so what I would like to do is to be able to, um, I would like to be able to offer you the opportunity, uh, to maybe have a conversation with our fire marshal. Um, that, that focus on community risk reduction and the things that we're doing uh, to be able to make sure that uh, you have an understanding and not only for emergency evacuations, uh, fire hydrants um, and development. He manages all new development. And so we're working through all that together. So um, you're, I also want to step back and I don't want to come off as your, your questions aren't valid to merit because the situations that you're addressing, they're historic. They're historic. And many of the criticisms I receive are things that I take full responsibility for. I didn't create, right? But I own it in its entirety. I do. I own all of this in, in its entirety. And so the situations that you're living, I'm living operationally, trying to serve and correct. I adopted in many ways. Uh, but your frustration has merit. It does. Uh, because it seems slow. It seems like it's not going on. We didn't arrive here overnight. I can't correct it overnight. We can't correct it overnight. But it's in the queue. And we're actively talking about these things. And so please stay engaged, communicate with us so I can uh, give you to the people to let you know where we are in those conversations. And it's they aren't just easy. If they're easy. They would have been done a long time ago. But we're, we're working on every one of those things you stated. And I want you to have clarity on. Next question, please. What do you say to the growing number of residents that think by continuing to push out ballot initiatives, you're just bailing out our elected officials in Brentwood, Oakley, and the county from having to make tough decisions of which they are elected to do, but not updating impact fees on an ongoing basis since the 80s and leaving the district hanging out the dry. I leave that up. I get my head out of the thing. So um, 
there's a lot to this question and and what i'm going to say is this um i think that the challenge that i have with this question is that the the understanding is look the impact fees being inadequate it is a challenge um and we are updating it and that impacts our infrastructure and we're in the process of updating it as we speak the the ballot initiatives be very clearly because there's a couple of things about the ballot initiatives is folks have been critical because we lack transparency we lack the plan if we got additional revenue we were historically being criticized for using scare tactics not living within our means and doing a lot of areas that historically there were a lot of reasons why people said we don't want to vote on it and also you're coming up, we were coming up with band-aid solutions not permanent fixes and we didn't have support from the community on initiatives so the reason we pushed them out is because the revenue was needed one um they we're not putting them out to bail out anybody we, we've been putting them out because the resources are needed the the challenge that we have also is that the newer concept the newer concept that has come up of recent is no new taxes no new revenue it's not new revenue there's already enough revenue in the system go get it from somewhere else go get it from another entity and take it to fund the fire district and we are actively working and communicating with communities to identifying voluntarily what of their revenues want to go to the fire district is it a viable option I, I i've facetiously said in the past is i'm not a magician i can't make money disappear out of nowhere and i'm not you know i'm not a thief i can't take it from other organizations and just put it in my ongoing revenue. I can't do it. So the, the thing is this, by taking revenue from another agency is gonna create deficits and cuts in other agencies. The other agencies have to entertain and explore if it is financially feasible and if they can do it. I will tell you that if it is done to the degree that we need, we're just gonna be having forums and discussions about service level deficits in another area. Every community is gonna have to choose on how they wanna do that. We're actively in conversations with other people. The fire district is short on revenue because we did not place the assessments respectfully on every property that has come in from the 70s, my home included. I'm a Brentwood resident. All of this would impact me. Many of your you know, firefighters within the system live within our communities. We were volunteers. I was a volunteer. Many of our members were volunteers. We promoted throughout the ranks. We choose to stay here. It impacts all of us. So the challenge that we have right now is the solution statement. I, and, and we are trying, and if you watch our board meetings, we're trying to do our due diligence to make sure that we're exploring alternative options outside of an assessment. We aren't just jumping to an assessment. So again, the, the thing I just want to re reiterate is that we do not have the ability just to get revenue from other entities. And taking revenue from other entities, depending upon the en entity, depending upon the amount, it, it, it could be detrimental in other areas, and that's a calculated decision for every community to make. And we're having those conversations. That's one. And number two, again, is that when and if that revenue comes in, we need to make sure it's guaranteed. It's not short term. It's sustainable, and it's the right amount to make sure that we can continue to get revenue. All of that creates its own complexities. So, um, you know, that that really is the answer is it's not about our bailing anybody out it's trying to get a guaranteed sustainable right amount solution through law and statute we are told assessments and taxes are the what we need to do we're doing that for future growth we apply the same methodology to our existing residents we wouldn't be having a service level today we can't do that without the existing residents we've been told find alternative means we've been spending years and we continue to and we'll continue to work on reallocation we'll continue to seek it from other entities we'll seek it from watch for other initiatives and other propositions. It is it is produced nothing. And but we continue to demonstrate and people that are actively engaged can see it. And so that's why we entertain and we look at it. It's not a matter of bailing anybody out. It's about exploring all options and, and meeting that criteria. So I'd be welcome to take that conversation offline too. Next question please. State of California has increased fires over the last five years. Each agency has to rely on its own resources at times when there are multiple incidents in other areas. We have to wait our turn and wait for resources to become available to assist. The fact that ECCFPD does not have enough resources to manage its day-to-day -day, uh, responses with only nine firefighters on duty covering 200 square miles, it doesn't take much um, to overtax the system. When you add multiple incidents that require a 
And I'm going to, I don't know where I, I have, I kind of have an idea where that's going. I'll put that back up real quick. Cause I was reading more than I was processing. Um, so yeah, I, what I'm going to say to this is that, listen, we, we continue, uh, our incidents continue to grow. Um, we continue to rely upon outside agencies. We know that firefighters, we have nine firefighters on a day, uh, 250, uh, 49 square miles, as I stated to you today, is that we continue to rely more and more on outside resources. And we're having multiple incidents where units are not available. Drop it, please. 25% um, of the calls where we are not making it. You can drop down the question. Um, listen, the problem statement, the resource issues is very real. Um, we all, I think that we agree and that we know that the solution challenge is the, is the situation. You know, I, I've gone back and I want to repeat this again because I, I want people to hear this because it's important. Is my job as your fire chief is to run the district of the revenues that I have. When I ever identify a deficit and an underservice to our citizens, it is my job to alert the forward board and provide recommended solutions and say that this is what should be adequate level of fire protection. This is the revenue that it takes to make that happen. And we all we come through alternative means and or they choose potentially put an assessment in front of the people to increase revenue to the fire district. If they choose to do that, they put that option in front of the people and the people get to choose. Do they want to invest in the service level increase or do they not? If the initiative passes, it's my job as directed by the board to take those revenues and increase the services as defined by the service level uh, benefit revenue. If it doesn't pass, it is my job to continue to run the organization with the revenues that I have. I do not have the authority. I do not have the power to ask for anything. It is my job as the CEO and the general manager and the fire chief of your fire district to run it. Our members do not have the tools and resources at hand to answer the call 25% of the time. I will continue to run this organization with the revenues that I have. Where I'm challenged is if this is who we're always going to be is the organization I want to lead, right? And our members to make the same thing. We all want to work here. We all want to be here. But if we don't have the revenues, we don't have the resources, it's hard. We want to fix it. We want to be a first class fire department to answer your calls. And so I am here to educate and inform and continue to provide the information, understand we're doing our due diligence and everything we can. And we need help. We need everyone to do their part. It's not to bail anybody out. It's not to do anything. This is educating and inform. The fire board will reconsider if we move forward and do something. We're demonstrating that we're exploring everything. But we need everyone to get engaged and know 60%. At one point, it was closer to 80% of all citizens within our jurisdiction didn't know who East Contra Costa Fire is. They did not know they had a service level challenge. Many people thought we were a Contra Costa County Fire, Brentwood Fire, Oakley Fire, Knightson Fire, Byron Fire, Bethel Island Fire. We are East Contra Costa Fire. Elected Board of Five with the revenues where we come from. All right. It, it, that's where we are. This is who we are. We are living within our means and this is what we can do. People need to know who we are our service level challenges, what we're doing to correct them, and we're living within our means. And without additional revenue, we will continue to. That's all I can do as the general manager of your fire district. And so I'm trying to adequately, you know, educate and inform. So that point going is that we don't have enough resources. We're trying to find the solution and do it. Do you have another question? Yes. So do the homes in Emerson Ranch pay higher taxes to fund East CFED? These homes almost pay double the property tax than others in Oakley. Yeah. If not, how will the new tax initiative uh, affect homeowners? So again, how will? Well, if, if the board decides to move through, you and Emerson Ranch, I believe the Gilbert properties, right? Um, Delta Coves, Delta Coves, Summer Lakes, Emerson Ranch, you you three, you, you are three of the communities that we're trying to get every other community in the jurisdiction to have that same type of assessment model on their properties. So the answer to your question is you do, and I thank you. You do invest into, and when you bought your home, you made that investment and you understood. You you are one of the, the voluntary developers that we worked with the saying, we have a very real issue and you're bringing it in, you're already entitled. You're already entitled, but we can't adequately provide protection. And they did the responsible thing and said, we want to be part of the solution. We invest into our community. We want our residents to have adequate fire. And they led by example. And we're continuing to work with other developers to continue moving forward. And yes, they took on that liability and responsibility and it is to you. And you are investing into the fire district and we need to get others 
to do exactly where you are or come up with an alternative means, right? And so the, to go directly to your question is we, we see you, we understand you, we understand that. We understand the optics of that. And the fire board is readily aware. And you can look, if you look at our strategic planning, one of our, our initiatives is to address the inequities of our taxpayers. And the inequities is we have some three homes, three communities that pay CFDs and nobody else does. Everyone pays the 1%, everyone pays the 1%. But for fire, three different small communities at the tune of maybe, I believe we're at about uh, 1500 homes of the 44,600 and change. 1500 of the 44,000 have these assessments on their properties and all future will. So no, I have your interest at hand. I want you to know that the board understands and sees you. We know that you're there. Uh, contact me, talk to me, monitor the situation, hold us accountable to it. Uh, when and if they decide to move forward, we will have a resolution at hand for you to receive a credit of the lesser of the two to make sure that we provide adequate fire protection. Very good question, fair question. Next one, please. As residents and business owners, how can we best support ECCD, FC, FC, ECC FPD and need to educate our community for the need to have an additional tax assessment? You know, I'm, I, will, I will say this, uh, not even so much about a tax assessment, it's about educate, educate and inform. I'm gonna say a majority, hopefully we're dwindling that, a majority of the citizens in our jurisdiction, again, don't know who we are, don't know they have service level challenges, don't know what their fire department's trying to do to correct them, and this information. If you can share these events with community members, if you can let them know about the district's website, if you can give them my cell phone number, my email address, if there's a community group to speak to, listen, until people understand the problem statement, they can't engage into a solution. And I don't, I'm more discouraged by those that don't understand the problem statement than those that don't either, even agree with the fire district's approach for the solution. There's a lot of concepts. We're trying to make one of them reality. But I'm overly concerned about people not knowing. Let people know about these Facebook Live events. Let them know about our website. Let them know about the town hall events. Get engaged. Get engaged. Um, it's very important. So educate and inform. Continue to monitor. People don't want to go to board meetings. I get it. I go to a lot of them too, right? I understand that, but they're a necessity. They're a necessity. And being actively engaged and understanding what's going on there is in your best interest to stay on top of things, but that's hard. So lean on me, lean on the members, become a community influencer. There's a lot of things that you can do to get engaged. If you, the email, my phone number, like I stated, if there's information, if you want to participate, we have a We Are Listening tab on our website. We Are Listening, you can put your information in. If you want to be a community influencer to be able to get this information out, to be, uh, to be able to, inform people about what's going on, get into the know what's going on with the fire district, go to coordinator meetings to figure out how we can inform. Um, there, if you go to we are listening at eccfpd.org, it's on our website, you can go there. Secondarily, if you wanna get our board agendas, press releases, you can sign up for our website on our homepage. Our, our website is a wealth of knowledge. So it's getting educated, it's getting informed, it's being aware of upcoming information, monitoring the board meetings, by monitoring the board meetings, um, that's where they make the decisions. If they're going to move forward with an assessment or not, the alternative solutions we're looking at in lieu of an assessment, the different propositions at the state, taxes, uh, the other taxes that may or may not impact us. We try to report out all this stuff. So being actively engaged is the best thing you can do. That's a great question. Next one, please. God bless you guys for the job and the obstacles that you overcome despite the challenges to my fellow citizens, responsible tax base, small price to pay for the service we receive. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Wonder if I have more residents downloaded the Pulse Point app. You know what? I always forget that. Amanda, though, thank you. Um, Pulse Point app, they might be a better idea of how stretched we are. Look, if you go in and President Off at all probably wants to hit, hit me over the head every time I get done with these things, I always forget the Pulse Point app. Go to the App Store, Pulse Point. If you want to monitor and you want to see what your resources are doing within East Contra Costa, uh, you can get alerted. Secondarily, if you know CPR, uh, it will alert you. If you say you're trained and you're willing to, it will notify you of cardiac events. Um, if, and where local access community level AEDs, automatic external defibrillators are, um, and it can alert you. Um, you can look and see how busy East Contra Costa Fire is. You can monitor the dispatch. Uh, some of our technical channels you will not be able to hear, uh, but you will be able to see the frequency that we go out to. We have three fire engines, 52, 53, and 59, uh, and Battalion 5, BC 5. 
um, you'll you will see um, how much we're running. So if you want to get a gauge of what we're doing daily operationally, that's there for you. Um, you can follow our Facebook page, a wealth of information on there too. Um, but I mean, a great information uh, to get engaged uh, in that program. Thank you. Next question. So we need more funding for President and Future Station as our community grows. This scenario seems to uh, to then be never ending if more housing development than general plan. Is that correct? No. Um, the plan we have does address the impacts for all general plans. So the next 20 years, we have assessed and we've looked at the county, Contra Costa County, the city of Oakland, and the city of Brentwood, their general plans for the next 20 years, and our impact fees are put in place to assess that growth. When and if the impact, I'm sorry, the general plans are adjusted, urban limit lines, that's the lines of which you can build to within cities, so it creates more density. Uh, urban limit lines are moved. We reassess, we readdress, and we look at our studies and we update them on a three to five year basis, and we take into account any adjustments, and those adjustments are incrementally placed on the future growth. So the, the growth, if it were to be, although growth isn't ever ending, in some cases maybe it is, um, but the point that I want you to know is that we are doing our due diligence now to ensure that our fees are assessed on a regular basis to mitigate the impacts of future growth. With escalators, make sure that we can, we can adjust things over time. So we are actively engaged in monitoring growth and we adjust every three to five years to make sure that a growth mitigates itself. The ongoing operations, we know what it is that we need um, in regards to address that issue. And if we were to get an assessment in place and or get revenue through alternative means, we would be able to be sustainable. The objective of the fire district, unless the board chooses otherwise, is to fix our problem. The fire board also can come and incrementally uh, do a step up method where they can ask for one station now, another station in two years, or one, two years thereafter. The assessment will escalate over a five-year period, and then it would cap with a small escalator to make sure that we can take care of cost, and it works out. All of the studies, when they're done and available, they're available to the public. There's, If they decide to move forward to that, it would go through an assessment. You can analyze it. You can look at it. You can understand the true impacts of it. Um, but it is, it is a transparent process in regards to what they would be if the board moves forward with them. But a growth situation, no, we're, we're, we're rectifying that in the right way. And the existing service level challenge, when and if the board moves forward with it, is gonna be taking the same approach. That's a great question, great question. If Morgan Territory mandatory evaluations, why are we letting non-residents drive in and out, uh, move the barrier over and check IDs? Uh, Amy? I agree with you that and so what I'll do is take a note of that uh, because you must have done that recently. Um, I know that my fire marshal, uh, Steve Albert, is monitoring the situation. Um, we will reach out to uh, CHP and or SO and we'll inquire as to why. Um, again, on mandatory evacuations, it is intended uh, for there to be a security to make sure that only um, those are allowed to, if at all, go into those areas. Uh, so I can't answer to if that is occurring. I'm stating it is. I trust that, uh, but we'll check in as to why. It, it shouldn't be working that way. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Post point is an amazing tool. Living on the highway, I'm amazed by the activity in Discovery Bay, the number of rigs, accidents. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it's enlightening. I agree. Um, sometimes leave in one to eight another back to back. Thank you for, for highlighting that. I do recommend Post Point. Next, please. None? Oh. Is there a valid measure in November uh, to provide more funds for the fire department that I can vote yes on? Karen, no, right now there isn't. And, and let me explain why. Um, the district is exploring all alternative means. We are, we are exploring and looking to see what we can do with uh, other land use agencies. We are actively monitoring any state initiatives that may impact positively or negatively the district. There's different propositions that may impact us. We're monitoring those. Uh, we're looking at the county county initiatives that are going forward that may or may not impact the fire district and all of those will be satisfied in the first week of november when we see the outcomes in the first week of november we need to take those positives and our negative hits on the fire district and account for them accordingly in addition i need to provide the board with a one station a two station a three station or three station deficit right and a three station tiered up plan that if for some reason we do find alternative means and we have a delta or a gap still. So we were able to find revenue to address a one station deficit. 
fantastic. That was guaranteed, sustainable, and guaranteed, right? Guaranteed, sustainable in the right amount for one station. Now we have a two station deficit. Why, we don't need to ask for three stations. If we do it for two, well, great. We only have a one station deficit. If we find alternative solutions that are guaranteed, sustainable, and the right amount for three stations, there is no ask. And so we are doing our homework and demonstrating through our behavior and trying to do everything we can within our ability to demonstrate that we are exhausting those means. I'm also doing a one station, two station, three station, like I said, and the tiered up is one station now, two years later, another station, and two years later, another station, three stations, five year window. We can use one term funds to be a catalyst to get us over those humps, over service level increases. I got to get all those studies done and the amounts done and, and explain the methodology and get those prepared for the board to analyze, to fill any gap that we need. And then they have to take in consideration, do they want to make that ask or not? That's why it is so readily important for people to understand the problem statement so nobody is surprised. I want everyone to be educated and be informed so you can make an educated decision on what it is individually from business to personal that people want to do. We're presenting the problem, we're providing the solutions, choices will be made, we continue to run the district and highlight the issues. So that's that's a process that we're in. November, they're going to be analyzing and re-looking at what we're doing and we're trying to make sure that this is something that we're going down the right direction that people want. Next question, please. Yeah, yeah, are we still, yes. So unless, let me look at my phone. Unless something's come up in the period of time and I do not have an update from um, Chief Albert and or Chief McCumber, which makes me believe that the mandatory evacuations are still in place. Please put that link back up in regards to the cafire.org and the phone number, please. Um, the, the question's a fair one. Um, that is gonna be driven by Cal Fire, fire.ca.gov backslash incident. Call that phone number, 669-247-7431. Um, that is a live recording that will tell you about the SCU lightning complex, which the deer zone is now part of, and they will speak to not only fire activity, acreage, and evacuations, if they've been lifted or not. That's the source. When we get information through our channels from CAL FIRE, we release it. But as of now, all mandatories are in place. I can't speak to as why people are going back. They shouldn't be going back. Things are not going on. Um, Chief Albert, I assume, is looking at the access law enforcement challenge right now to see where we're at. And, um, but again, that, that is managed by uh, law enforcement in regards to evacuations, but thank you for the information. Next question. The amount that every homeowner would pay per year, per month would be worth every penny. These firefighters that protect us and put their lives on the daily line, there's no reason homeowners shouldn't pay to increase funding and fire protection. Thank you for your perspective. Uh, Michelle, next question, please. Um, it's something uh, we should, uh, it's not a small price pay. It's something we should have to pay extra for a period. San Ramon gets 14 cents of their ad valorem to fire. They get 10K more residents than Brentwood. ECF gets seven. There's a problem with a broken allocation structure. It needs to be fixed there. Our cities need to hold the state and feed accountable. Um, I would strongly again recommend, please, um, I want to talk, I would love to talk with you offline. Uh, please go to the district's legal analysis on that process. I want you to know that I spent the first year here mining that out. If you go up to the Capitol, the state is not going to change the state proposition for the interest and the benefit solely of East Contra Costa Fire. I'm also working on a coalition up and down the state. I've been working two years on it. Not much to show for it. I'm disappointed in that. If I can find maybe 20, 25, 30 different agencies throughout the state that we can do a state initiative to correct it for, the state may entertain doing something because it's a state issue. I has been made very clear to me, the lack of good governance, the lack of the district's due diligence, which I'm responsible for, and the lack that we did not manage growth effectively at the local level is why we're here. That's not a state issue. It's a very local issue. The assessments that are not on the property should have been placed there when they came in. The fire district missed the boat. We have the deficit. So we have tried to work with the state. Furthermore, we have the California Districts Association, CSDA. Fire Department Associations of California were members of that. They represent us in many matters. Said, 
If you look for reallocation and natively impacts your other partners and reduces their service levels to increase yours, non-discussion starter. You can't impact one negatively to in increase one positively. And, and we've also went around our jurisdiction and tried to voluntarily have other entities take a certain part of their revenue and give it to the fire district. And that's hasn't gone so well. We're still having those conversations. We'll continue to have those conversations. But to reduce service level or services from any entity to increase ours, I will tell you that right now people feel fire is more invaluable. But I can equally tell you that people are as passionate about schools, there's passionate about parks, there's passionate about libraries, there's passionate about whatever. And I don't have any control over that, but we are making the asks, we are making the pushes, and we are trying. But understand that process. You can't take it. You can't make it happen out of nothing. And uh, many say that you need new revenue for new services. And taking from one to impact another is challenging. So I want to be very clear as we're trying, sir. If you're watching and seeing, and you can read the legal analysis and see the obstacles that we're up against, um, and we're continuing to try, but it just hasn't worked. So I think that is my marker. We're well over. I apologize. I can't believe it's already, it's 740. Unbelievable. I hope this has been valuable. The next event on live stream is going to be August 25th at six o'clock. Um, I don't take this situation lightly and I want to do some housekeeping. We have a town hall and discovery day. Everyone's welcome. Everyone in our community is welcome to go to that event. I think it'd be a wealth of information. We'll do some very specific discovery bay topics as we did in Bethel Island. There's some very specific community issues operationally, historically, that we want to address and, and, and discovery bay the same thing. But listen, all you residents of our jurisdiction, all of you are important. Okay. All of you are important. No call, no one calls more important than the other. Every citizen is important, um, equally important. All right. But we, we, I need the communities to help me. They look at, they look at us through their lenses as their community and no other communities matter. All you matter. We're serving you all. It's important. Um, I also want to state this real quick on some housekeeping. Um, is that, and again, I'm sorry we ran over, continue to share this. Um, if you didn't get to ask any questions tonight, you can contact me offline. Can we put uh, my, uh, do we put my information? Thank you. Um, put my information up there, continue to reach out to me as I'll continue to work with you. Bring your questions back to another meeting. If I missed your question or whatever, continue asking it. I wanna get it right. Uh, not that I wanna get it right, I wanna give you the actual relevant information, okay? Um, that is, we are recording this, so you can go back and watch this and you can share it. I also want to say that we're using multiple mediums. And one thing I want to highlight, I got notified today and I'm disappointed by it is listen, we are um, sending out through multiple mediums information uh, to members within our communities. Um, we're trying to do things as responsibly as we can. Uh, we were doing bulk mailing. You know, you do bulk mailing, you get a reduced rate uh, instead of doing it outside of bulk mailing. So we've been trying to do communications and we've done three different mailers to um, all the property owners in our jurisdiction. One was supposed to go out uh, the week of uh, July 27th. One was supposed to go out the week of August 10th and on the 17th. Um, we have two more that we're continuing to push out in the very near future. Uh, come to find today, all three showed up once. This one. We did not send them all at once. I, we, we, had a, we had a better plan than that. It didn't work out. I'm responsible for it, my bad. Um, the, 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 the messaging is relevant. Timing didn't work. I couldn't believe that all I'm being told people are getting three different messages on one day. So I don't want you to think that your fire district that was in our intent uh, due to COVID. Bulk mailing, learn today, has been kind of held up and things are uh, flowing out in a rate of which that we did not anticipate. So uh, listen, the message is important. The message is relevant, but we didn't intend for it to come out like that. You should see two more, hopefully spread out. Um, but I'm sorry, three more two to three more. So um, please watch the next live stream event um, and share this. Uh, I do want to thank everyone for being here. If I'm a little scattered. I apologize, uh, but I hope that uh, this was informational for you. So this is going to conclude tonight's meeting and we look forward to the opportunity to continue to educate and inform you. Those that are investing the time here, I don't take it for granted. Please share it. Um, I'm open to any feedback or constructive criticism to serve you better. So until the next event, I want to thank you for your continued support and please be safe.